Right. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for coming today. Um, again, I'm Courtney Bobson, a master's student um, at the University of Washington. And I'll be talking today about understory development in thin stands as part of the long-term ecosystem productivity study. Um, and just to give a little bit of background and introduction before we get kind of into the meat of the experiment itself, um, I've divided my different understory categories Thank you. Um, into a handful of different categories to better understand um, the change in understory development and vegetation over time. And I've divided them into six different categories. Um, graminoids, so our grasses, sedges, and rushes, um, herbs and forbs, both deciduous and evergreen ferns separated, as well as deciduous and evergreen woody shrubs separated out. And I'll be referring to this further on in the presentation as well. Um, the understory plays a key role in forest dynamics. It's both um, the understory is both influencing as well as being influenced by the overstory layer. So as we think about um, a nice stand in the forest, the overstory and canopy is influencing how much light is reaching the forest floor, which is then in turn um, dictating how much vegetation and in what capacity that is able to grow. And in turn, that understory vegetation is directly impacting the amount of natural seedling regeneration we will or possibly will not be achieving. Um, in addition, the understory plays an important part um, in and of itself in a forest stand. We see these recalcitrant species, so these prolifically growing understory species that we'll be talking a lot more about in the presentation, um, that has the potential to really take over the understory layer and make a huge impact um, in the long-term sense of a forest stand. In addition, wildlife is a key consideration. Um, it both provides habitat as well as food, um, and the understory is um, playing a key role in the, in the survival of wildlife. Um, anything from a pollinator all the way up to large game are things that we could potentially be seeing in this research, research site, as well as all over the OESF network. Um, in addition, the seedling regeneration is an important consideration, especially as we think about um, the potential next generation of an overstory and as well as timber. Um, the understory um, is important for soil nutrient cycling and stability, um, especially the deciduous plants that we see um, in the vegetation level are dropping its leaves in the fall and winter and really um, cycling back into the soil. It's also providing quite a bit of stability and not quite on the capacity that our overstory or trees are providing, but it still um, is a key player in that. And finally, as well as carbon storage. And just like trees, it's maybe not providing quite as much carbon storage as our big conifers and other trees out there, but it is playing a key role in that capacity as well. So on the Sappho site, Salal is a very prolifically growing species, as we'll see later on. And so I wanted to take a minute to explain a little bit more about Salal's overall growth and reproduction. So it's an evergreen woody shrub that I'm sure most of you have seen on your hikes or out on your study sites as well. It can both reproduce sexually and asexually through um, uh, its rhizome network, so these underground shoots that are popping up um, and growing new plants. This uh, photo here on the right-hand side is a photo of just Salal, and that's a thicket that's growing on the Sappho research site, and this is not atypical for our site. Um, and so it's important to understand how it's um, really respreading and growing so quickly and well on the study site. It has the capability to grow um, from full shade all the way up to full sun. And it's kind of interesting to be out on the Sappho site and see it growing under this really dense um, canopy closure and then all the way up to these huge um, areas with no trees whatsoever. And it's growing really well in both of those environments. Um, it can compete with hemlock and other species as well, but hemlock in particular for nutrients and resources. And a few papers have cited that Salal can outcompete the amount or outcompete for nutrients um, in terms of hemlock growth. And finally, it's not the most ideal food source for our large game that we might potentially want to come onto um, our, our land and our forest area. Um, Salal's leaf doesn't, or leaves don't provide a ton of nutrients for our large game, although um, it can be a potential food source, but it's not maybe the most ideal for uh, the elk and deer that are living on the peninsula. So I, my study, the study I've been working on is the long-term um, ecosystem Productivity Study, or often referred to as LTEP. Um, it's part of the OESF network that we've been talking about all morning. And this study began in the early 1990s. It's part of multiple studies across Washington and Oregon, but my research is primarily and exclusively, rather, um, on the Sappho site, um, just 11 miles north of where we're standing right now. 
Um, and it's investigating the best forest management practices, both for ecosystem services as well as for timber and kind of um, doing its best to investigate both of those things. The Sappho site in particular has been measuring four um, different elements over the course of the last 20 to 25 years. Um, there's been pre-treatment as well as post-treatment measurements for all of these things, including soil, the understory, overstory, as well as litter. And my research is primarily focused on the understory layer and kind of digging into that data. So I have, just for the understory, I have pre-treatment measurements as well as four post-treatment measurements. So quite a bit of data has accumulated for me to look at and see what the change has been over time. I have a handful of different research objectives that I'll be kind of teasing through as I work um, on finishing up my thesis. The first is to determine how the understory compos composition has changed over the last 20 years and what, um, that's in what that influence has been on the overall stand. Also investigating prolific growing or these recalc recalcitrant species, um, salal and potentially bracken fern, and their impact on the overall understory composition as well as seedling regeneration. Um, I'm gonna be investigating how species of concern or threatened wildlife are utilizing these understory species growing in early seral, mid seral, and late seral forests. And finally, understanding the relationship between understory richness and abundance and natural seedling regeneration um, in these three different forests, early seral, mid seral, and late seral. So the Sappho site has four blocks of 10 plots, totaling 40 overall plots. In each of these blocks, there are these 10 plots. There's three early seral or pioneer forest. There's three mid seral, um, and that actually means a Douglas fir plantation style and not the mid seral we were talking about earlier today. And, and finally, three late seral plots, as well as a control. Um, the early and mid seral plots were clear cut in the mid 1990s and replanted. Um, the early serials were replanted mixed conifer and red alder, and the mid serials were replanted Douglas fir plantation style. The three late serial plots, or all of the late serial plots for that matter, um, were selectively thinned, and then we also have a control. And I will mention the late serials were a 70-year-old stand approximately in the 1990s when the study was implemented. There's also a woody debris component to the study. Um, there's three levels of woody debris that's been left on site in the 1990s, um, ranging from one to three, one being a small amount of woody debris, two being medium, and three being a high amount of woody debris left on site. So if we think about the three early serial um, plots in any particular block, one of those early serials is low level, one is a mid-level of woody debris, and one is a high level of woody debris. So all of these different woody debris treatments are being shown through in all of the different treatment groups. So again, I'm focused on the understory measurements, and in this past field season in 2016, I went out and collected all of the understory measurements with my crew. And that entailed collecting percent cover of each understory species present, the overall biomass of the plot, the tallest shrub and its corresponding species, a seedling count and its corresponding species, as well as an overall plot composition. And we broke those down into different categories, including rock, soil, wood, bryophyte, stump, and live bowl. And all of these understory plots are uh, three by three meters. And in any given larger menstruation plot, which again, there are 40 of these larger menstruation plots, there's 15 or 16 understory plots. So we're talking 600 plus understory plots to survey and look at. So we have quite a large sample size and you can imagine a very robust data set to evaluate. So just to get into a, a little bit of the results that I've been finding so far as I've been kind of teasing through the data and working through it all, I started by looking at the um, overall change in species composition over time. So again, I broke it down into six different categories and looked at how they've been changing in terms of percent cover over the last 20 years. Um, so we have four different measurement time periods listed here. And um, on the left-hand side, we, we see the control right here as well as the early serial um, next to it on the right-hand side. And so we see on the control plots a kind of smoother increase in um, the different treatment in the different um, composition groups um, when compared to the early sterols, where we see a huge increase in the amount of deciduous ferns and evergreen woody shrubs, where we have deciduous uh, ferns up at almost 50% cover in the early sterol plots, as compared to the control plots that have not even 20% of those deciduous ferns. So there's quite a big difference between um, those two groups, uh, the control versus the early sterols. Um, in terms of the overall cover and what um, stands out as the predominant types of species that could be there or are there. And then as we look um, at the mid-serial versus late-serial here, 
The mid serials see a very similar trend as the early serial plots, um, and that rings true for most of uh, my analysis as well. Early serial and mid serials, uh, and to remind you, early serials are mixed conifer red alder, and mid serials are Douglas fir plantation style. We're not seeing a ton of difference in the overall composition and the overall pattern of growth. So these mid serial plots also see large increases in evergreen woody shrubs and deciduous ferns, with the deciduous ferns here being 45% or so, so still quite a bit of cover of these ferns, primarily bracken fern, that's um, kind of taking over um, the plots. And then we see the other categories kind of petering out and there's not a ton of increase overall. Although as we look at the late serial treatment group, that's a little bit of a different story. We again see those same increases in our evergreen woody shrub and deciduous uh, ferns, but the cover there is 25% um, instead of 50% with what we saw in the early serial plots. So there is quite a bit of difference between the late serials and the early and mid serial plots. And then I wanted to look at specifically Salal and Bracken fern. When I was out on the plots this summer, it seems like those were the most prolifically growing species. And then after looking at the data, um, it really rang true that those are two species that are growing um, in heavy numbers. And so I wanted to look at those specifically to see how those have been changing over time. And so um, we see over here Galthier Shalon or Salal is really increasing on the plots, especially from 2002 to 2016. We see that the control early serial and mid serial have two to three times as much Salal on site. Um, and then at the late serial level, there's a little bit of increase in Salal, but not to the capacity that there is for the other treatment groups. So we're seeing this um, really huge, huge increase in Salal on the plots, which could affect um, our natural seedling regeneration as well as all the other things we talked about earlier. Um, as we look at the bracken fern, we see a similar pattern where there's an increase from 2002 to 2016, but not quite as dramatic necessarily as the Salal levels. Uh, again, we see um, that increase in control early serial and mid serial, but in this case, we also see the late serial have quite a bit of gain in uh, bracken fern as well. And then I wanted to move into some seedling data. So on the plots, we collected data for three different types of seedlings. A class one seedling is anything that's um, lower or shorter than 30 centimeters. A class two is between 30 and 136 centimeters. And class threes are above 136 centimeters, so above DBH. And um, those are the three different classes that we used when we were on the sites. And so in the control plots from 93 to 2002, we see this huge decrease in class one seedlings and then just a slight bump up. Just to be clear, the seed that's conifer seedlings and mostly have one. Yes, sorry. Yeah, so we say seedlings in terms of all of the seedlings present, but I would venture to say between 80% and maybe 90% is um, strictly hemlock seedlings. Um, so we're kind of swimming through hemlocks all over the place in these different plots. Um, uh, so these control plots see, I see these big decrease with just ever so slightly a bump up of class one seedlings between the 2002 and 2016 measurement for the control plots. And then as we look at the early serial treatment group, this is only early serial. Um, on the left hand side up here, we have E1, meaning early serial with a low amount of woody debris, all the way down to E3 and early serial with a high amount of woody debris. So we see a similar pattern where we uh, have this large decrease in the smaller class one seedlings, but we don't see really any bump up again for class one seedlings and no real increase in class twos or threes for early serial. Um, in total, we have less than one uh, seedling per square meter for any of these plots after 1996. This is the mid serial, so Douglas fir plantation style, and we see very similar results um, in the mid serials as the early serials. So a huge decrease in class one seedlings from 93 to 96, and then not much change in any of the seedlings after that. So less than one seedling per square meter um, from 96 on in all of the woody debris treatments in the mid serial plots as well. The late serials, although, is more exciting to look at. So we have a decrease again from 93 to 96, but then we see this bump up again um, from 96 to 2000 across the board in all the different woody debris treatments. So there's much more variability in class one seedlings um, as well as class two seedlings in the late serial plots. 
Although in the late serials, you see a decrease in class one seedlings as an increase in class two seedlings happen. Um, hopefully indicating that the class ones are becoming class two seedlings and growing um, as the measurement years go on. And we also see that as class two seedlings decrease, class threes are increasing. So we're hopefully seeing this uh, change um, from class one to two to three as these seedlings are growing up with um, some amount of seedling death over time as well. Um, just so uh, to go through some brief conclusions, the control group, um, we have noted that there's high tree mortality both in the 80s and 90s at the overstory layer, at the overstory level rather, um, both before and after the treatment was um, implemented. And this increased a lot of light onto the forest floor. Um, and that could lead to the canopy really closing up quickly and causing that decrease that we saw in the class one seedlings between 96 and um, 2000, and sorry, 93 and 2002 rather. Um, and we saw a slight increase in seedlings by 2016, um, influenced by maybe a suppression of these seedlings due to increased understory growth. So we saw a huge increase in salal in particular, as well as bracken fern, and that could have influenced the amount of seedlings that are, or rather are not growing in the control groups. The early and mid serials really saw similar results across the board, with salal more than doubling across the board for both mid and, uh, and early serials, and bracken fern increasing but not quite doubling. The seedling growth is limited by competition with salal and other understory species. And we're seeing that less than one seedling per square meter in all of the different treatment groups for early and mid serial across all of the woody debris treatments. Um, and that's really inhibiting our natural seedling regeneration that we might want to be having um, as it will become the next overstory layer. We're really not seeing that in early and mid serial plots. The late serial treatment group though, um, had a, has a large decrease in the class one seedlings in, in the 96 measurement, um, followed by an increase in 2000, thank you, um, indicating that these seedlings are highly variable and um, potentially very sensitive to um, different events that are happening on these sites. The class one seedlings decline as some become class two seedlings and, and so on and so forth. Um, the overall cover of the understory species is lowest in this treatment group, um, which if you recall, the deciduous ferns were the highest at 25%, so not as much cover as we're seeing in the other treatment groups. Um, and they have much higher quantities of seedlings by the 2016 measurement, um, ranging from two to um, five seedlings in class ones. Um, in class two seedlings had 1.5 to 2.4 seedlings per square meter, and class three is two and a half to three seedlings per square meter. Um, so we're seeing much more variation in those uh, class one, two, and three seedlings in this treatment group when compared to the early and mid serials that had less than one seedling per square meter. Um, overall species richness is decreasing in all of the treatment groups as well. Um, and that could be that some species are increasing their cover and choking out other ones. In particular, there's been um, a decrease in deciduous woody shrubs um, over time, especially in the 2016 measurement, indicating that maybe salal or some other species are really taking over and choking out a lot of the other ones. Um, and that leads to the potential of some recalcitrant species like salal and bracken fern. Um, and that leads to implications for overall biodiversity at the understory, at the understory level. And we could be seeing um, increased uh, or more decreases in overall species richness over time. And that has an impact on natural seedling regeneration. And finally, um, this has big implications for wildlife as we think about what wildlife we want or want to retain on site. The understory species that are present could provide some habitat, excluding salal. There's other ones that could be providing habitat as well as a food source for wildlife. But salal is an undesirable plant species for a large game. And so as we see this increase in cover in salal over time, we have the potential to drive away a lot of our large game that we might want on site. And that's something to think about as we um, consider future management for the site. I just want to give a few thank yous um, to D uh, DNR as well as UW, um, my master's committee Bernard Borman and Teddy Minkova as well as Kern Ewing and my three wonderful interns Ali Erskine, Catherine Jesser and Alec Mead that um, surveyed 500 understory plots with me last summer and spent a ton of time doing that and I couldn't have done it without them so thank you all so much. <laughs>